Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 215 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, speaking of 15, it is almost 15 years since I started writing for the internet in a little blog called The 5-Minute Medievalist. And when I started that, my intention was to make anybody a medievalist in about five minutes. Now, as you know, that's kind of turned around on me and that's kind of become a name that I'm using. But I thought that in honor of medievalist.net, picking up my two books that are called The 5-Minute Medievalist and The 5-Minute Medievalist's Guide to Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse, in honor of those being available on Patreon as well as my website, I thought I would dive back into the idea about making people or helping people become medievalists five minutes at a time. So today's episode is going to be little things that you can do five minutes at a time that are going to make you a better medievalist if you're at the beginning of your journey or to make you a better medievalist if you're further along in your journey. So that is what we're going to be talking about today, how to become a five-minute medievalist. When I started writing The 5-Minute Medievalist as my own little blog for the internet, it was either late 2008 or into 2009 that I started writing it. And I was just writing it at home because I wanted to share what I had learned in university about the Middle Ages because there was so much that I thought was really interesting that I didn't see a lot of on the internet in terms of what life was really like at the time. And I remember also being influenced by the TV show The Tudors, which was on And people were asking me questions because of my studies about that world, about that life, what was life like back in the day. So when I started writing this, it was kind of early-ish in the internet. I mean, it was not the beginning of the internet, but it was still a time when websites were pretty ugly, for example, (laughs) and there wasn't a huge amount of blogging or writing about the Middle Ages per se. There wasn't a lot out there. And at the time... I wanted to make sure that more people knew more things. And that's always been my mission. But I was doing it in small increments, just little things that I thought were interesting. And that has evolved into a career to my delight and surprise. And I don't know if you remember this part of my story, but it got picked up by Medievalist.net. And that's how my work ended up getting to be further afield. More people got to see it. But I don't know if you remember this time, if you're old enough to remember this time or if you're in medieval studies at this time, but it wasn't a time when public scholarship was very popular. It wasn't a time when public scholarship was valued very much. I really did feel like I was a rebel historian, a rebel teacher of some kind doing this stuff on the internet. And of course, things have changed immensely since then. Not only attitudes towards public history in terms of writing for the internet and reaching out to the public, that's really changed in beautiful ways. I love to see this happening. But also the technology has changed massively. There's just been so much positive change in terms of technology. And I think that it's going to make it easier for anybody who's interested in history to learn more about it. So a lot of the things I'm going to suggest to you today are things that you could do sort of analog, but they're much easier to do in the digital world. So I'm so happy to see the changes that have happened since I started writing this little blog. And I'm, of course, so happy that what started as a tiny little blog that I was writing just to keep my sanity when I had a newborn at home has become a podcast that's listened to by thousands and thousands of people every week. So thank you so much for allowing this to happen. And let's dive into how you can be a better medievalist or become a medievalist five minutes at a time. The first thing I would suggest to you that is perhaps a lot easier now than it was when I first started writing is to learn a language. Duolingo, I started going back into Duolingo, never had tried it before last year, but I had learned French all my life at school and had really let it get rusty. So I went on to Duolingo to rework my French, to refresh my French, and it's really a great way to learn. So when you're studying the Middle Ages, it's important to have a second language in your back pocket. Latin, if you're studying Western Europe, is really, really important. But if Latin isn't your jam, and they do teach it on Duolingo, for example, if Latin is not your jam, that's okay. If you learn a Romance language, that's really going to help you as well. So I learned French being from Northern Ontario. That's what we did. And that's been so helpful, even in decoding some Latin, because my Latin is not amazing. 
but having French to lean on will give me some cores to the words that I'm trying to learn and allow me to decode things a bit better than I might. And I'm going to come back around to why this is important in a second. So other languages that could be really important if you're learning about the Middle Ages, French, of course, German is a good one, Arabic, if you're studying anything intellectual, especially in the middle part of the Middle Ages, and Persian, too, if you want to learn more about what's going on to the east of Western Europe, because there's so much that's going on. Arabic and Persian will help you. But if you're really focused on Western Europe, Latin, really important, French and German. So when I talk about using these things to decode a little bit, having a language in your back pocket allows you to look at a piece of work that's in a different language. And even if you're doing five minutes a day on something like Duolingo, you can find those little core words that tell you if you're in the passage that you want it to be. So if you're looking through a primary source that's in Latin or in French, you can find those little core words that will tell you whether it's worth picking up this bit of language and putting it into a translator. I do think that translators are really helpful. I do think that they're not at the point at which you can get a really good translation of something, but you can usually get a workable translation of something. And this is when having just a little bit of language in your pocket will allow you to sculpt the translation so that it makes a little bit of sense. Latin, for example, can be challenging when you're looking at a medieval passage because first of all, there's all sorts of abbreviations, which it's good to brush up on. But also medieval Latin is just a little bit messy when it comes to Latin as the language. Classical Latin is very clean. Medieval Latin is a bit messy, which is one of the reasons that I took the English route instead of the Latin route when I became a medievalist. So sometimes you can put something into a translator. It might be a little bit messy. So the more language that you have in your mind, the easier it's going to be to understand what the passage means. If you need a really fine translation, of course, you should go to someone who has years put into this language. But for workable understandings of things, just putting in five minutes learning a new language or refreshing a language that you already know every day is really going to help you understand more and more of the primary sources from the medieval world. And really, there is no downside to learning a second language or a third language or a fourth language, except for maybe you get confused when you're trying to order in a restaurant. <laughs> I remember taking French and Latin at the same time in high school, and it made for some tests that were kind of challenging. But otherwise, there's no downside to learning a new language. It's going to help you in life. It's going to help you make new friends, and it's going to help you travel and enjoy the world as well as passages from the Middle Ages. The second thing I'm going to suggest you're probably already doing, and that is follow medievalists on social media. So in case you are not familiar with my story, one of the other reasons I went by the 5-Minute Medievalist when it started being applied to me instead of everyone else is that I was trying to hide my name because doing public history was not something that we were supposed to do if you wanted to be a serious, quote-unquote serious academic. And I was looking for a job in the college system. So I hid my name and I went by the 5-Minute Medievalist. And at some point, don't remember which year actually, I decided to put my name out the front and it was a great decision, the best decision, because this is my work and I should have it attached to my name. What I'm getting at here is because the environment has totally changed, you have all sorts of medievalists who are out there with their real names and their real credentials on social media. And we used to find each other mostly on Twitter, but Twitter is dying a slow death. I should call it X, I suppose. That is one of the signs of the apocalypse, perhaps. So there are lots of people who are still on Twitter. You can find all of these medievalists. There it used to be under the hashtag medieval Twitter, which could be a spicy place at times, but you can find really good stuff, including very good research there. And in fact, I found a lot of guests for this podcast through medieval Twitter. So that is a good place to find people and pick up their names, even if you decide to chase them to another part of social media. A lot of them are starting to build up a community on Blue Sky and I'm there as well, although I'm not doing a lot of posting. So I'm still under 5MI and Medievalist. You can find me on Blue Sky. But there are a lot of people building up a community there from Twitter. It's like an exodus that's happening. And you can use the hashtag Medieval Sky there. And you should be able to find a lot of the same people and a lot of discussions that are happening around history. And these are really great. I mean, if you are somebody who is a total beginner to the field, you can just listen in on the discussions that are happening on social media. 
and you will learn a whole lot about the Middle Ages because while there are sometimes some knockdown, drag out fights on social media, most of the time what's happening is people are sharing their expertise out there for free. And one of the people who's perhaps best at doing that is our friend John Wyatt Greenlee, who came on to talk about eels. I found him on medieval Twitter talking about eels, and so did a lot of the world's media, and now he is known as the eel guy. But he's out there giving you information every day, and he's just one of the people. Eleanor Yanigo was doing that as well. I mean, I was out there doing that. Medievalist.net was out there doing that. You can find a lot of medievalists on social media. Medieval TikTok is actually a really good place to be as well. There are a lot of scholars there. The one thing I would say about following anyone who's doing history on Maine is to make sure that you pay attention to them for a little while before you start taking their information as gospel. In that, there are a lot of people out there that are rehashing old myths or they're coming up with really simplistic visions of the past, kind of like what we were talking about last week on the podcast. So just pay attention to them for a little while and decide if that's someone you want to hitch your wagon to. I think that a lot of us have a good nose for social media now to see what is probably garbage and what is good. If you look for somebody's university credentials, it can be useful. But given the state of academia right now where humanities departments are shrinking drastically, there are a lot of people out there like me who are not affiliated with a certain post-secondary institution. So it's helpful to see that they've been associated with an institution in terms of teaching or in terms of their degree. It's not always the case that they are one of these people. So, I mean, pay attention to what they're putting out there and use your best judgment. There are so many good people out there to follow and you're going to find them and you're going to have a great time just spending five minutes on medieval social media each day or a few times a week. The third thing I'm going to suggest to you is something I'm really passionate about, and that is reading primary sources, because there is so much that's really valuable in reading secondary sources. So primary sources being written by the people at the time for themselves, for their audiences, and secondary sources being written about those things. So a primary source is a poem, for example, from the Middle Ages. A secondary source is a history book about the Middle Ages. Hopefully, I'm making that distinction clear for you. But you want to read the primary sources. You want to read the stuff that was written by the people at the time. And the internet has made that easier than ever, which is so amazing. So amazing. I'm so happy to see it. I think that the internet has just made it so much easier to find primary sources and read them. And it's such an important part of understanding this time. I've mentioned them before, but the Teams Middle English Text series is amazing. It is amazing. And I'm pretty sure that it was out there posting full texts of medieval primary sources in Middle English from the time I started to write for the internet. So that would be nearly 15 years now. And it's awesome. So it is stuff that's shared in Middle English, which can be a little bit tough. So Middle English is the synthesis of Old English and that Norman French that gets kind of shoved on top of it. And it becomes the most beautiful well, I'd like to think of it as a platypus. It becomes the most beautiful platypus of a language. But at the same time, it can be a little bit tricky, especially because in the modern world, we are getting further and further away from understanding the vocabulary of people, even from Shakespeare's day, that modern English. So it can be a little bit challenging, but that doesn't mean it's not worth looking at, especially when you're looking at the team's Middle English text series, because it is oriented towards students. So there are translations when there's a particularly tough passage and there are little glosses to explain what a word might be because some of the words are ones that we don't use anymore. So it does take some effort to read them. But at the same time, there's such cool stuff there. For example, you can read for free a whole collection called Robin Hood and Other Outlaw Tales. So you can read some of the earliest ballads of Robin Hood right there on the internet for free. And I think that's absolutely awesome. And if you can read it in the language in which it was originally written, I think you get closer to the people. So we were talking about language right at the beginning of the podcast. And the more time you spend in a second language, the more you really understand the nuances around certain words. So as somebody who loves language, who loves English as a language, I can tell you that looking at Middle English, you can really understand as you dive into it more, 
the nuances around particular words, even if they weren't familiar to you at the outset. It'll also be fun if you are a nerd and you like words to see things like the word cleave and how it means to part things, but it also means to bring things together really tight. That kind of stuff I think you can only get if you dive into old versions of the language. So the Teams Middle English text series is amazing. You can also get primary sources that are in translation that are very energetic and good. And those are getting to be more accessible. And a lot of them are relatively cheap. So I love the Penguin Classics. I think everybody does. I should probably mention that I'm represented for How to Live Like a Monk and Chivalry and Courtesy by Penguin Random House in Canada. But this is not why I'm talking about Penguin. I just really love those classics because I've never been somebody who had a lot of money, but I've always been somebody who loved to read. So Penguin classics are usually really good translations of old stuff. You can find everything. You can find Dante and Machiavelli. You can find Boccaccio. You can find Marie de France. You can find pretty much anything in Penguin classics. And most of them are available at used bookstores because somebody read them in university and gave them away. So those are really good. Also, Broadview Press, which is located in Peterborough, Ontario, which is my old stomping grounds when I was at Trent University. Broadview has a lot of good primary sources in translation, and they're relatively cheap as well because they are aimed at students. I'll drop some of my favorite translators here. One of them is a Broadview edition of Beowulf. That is Roy Liuza's Beowulf. Having read that in Old English and having read it in Roy Liuza's translation, I really like that one best. Nigel Bryant is an excellent translator. He's done the biography of William Marshall. He's done Porcephorus, which is an absolutely massive book of old Arthurian stuff, which I love. Nathaniel Dubain has a whole bunch of really good stuff, including the Fablio. Our friend of the podcast, Renata Blumefeld Kaczynski, has really good translations of Christine de Pizan. She's not the only one who's translating Christine, but I like her work for sure. And of course, for coming to one of my favorite poems ever, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, I think J.R.R. Tolkien's translation from back in the day is just super excellent. So these are just some translators. If you see their names, you know that it's going to be an energetic translation that you're going to enjoy reading. And enjoyment is what it's all about, right? That's why we're here at the Medieval Podcast, because we love this stuff. You want a good translation of a primary source so that you can get in touch with the people who were writing at the time and understand what they're trying to say to us. Because when people are writing, of course they're writing for an immediate audience, but we definitely see in the Middle Ages, they're writing for posterity, which is why we see things like reader, pray for my soul. They're imagining somebody in the future reading. So that's us, that's you. We can do this five minutes a day and really enjoy ourselves and get to know this world a lot better. The fourth thing, which was really not available back in the day and is so available now and is so exciting, is to look at manuscripts and material objects. Especially manuscripts were just beginning to be scanned when I started to write for the internet. And this doesn't mean that the scanning work had only just started. It means that you had to have a lot of really powerful equipment. You had to have a lot of bandwidth. You had to be able to download it you know, from your own computer to actually look at something, you had to be able to have a fast enough internet connection to do that. So there are a lot of things that changed that have made it possible for us to look at manuscripts. And it's just such a cool and important part of studying the Middle Ages. So why is it important to look at an old book? If we're reading the translation anyway, why do we need to look at the book? And I think it gives you a greater appreciation for the actual effort that goes into the books and for the material culture around books. So when you zoom in, which you can do now, when you zoom in on a manuscript and you see the hair follicles, like I was talking about with Peter when we were talking about e-codices, when you zoom in on that and you see the hair follicles, it reminds you that this is something that was written on a bit of sheep, right? So this is a sheep that was taken care of by someone, that was fed, that was cared for, that was eventually slaughtered and then tanned and then turned into parchment. That is a whole process of people who are living beings and a sheep who's a living being who are contributing to this book production. So I think even that, you get to see a bigger part of the world, a bigger world than you might if you were not looking at an actual manuscript itself. 
I think you look at something like this and it accordions you out into seeing the matrix, right? You start to see all these letters coming down from the sky. You start to see the matrix. You start to see everything that goes into these books. And you get a real appreciation for how much time and effort goes into actually hand lettering the books, hand painting the books. Because when you look at a piece of painting in a medieval manuscript, first of all, you'll see how bright the colors are and how well they've lasted for hundreds of years. It's amazing. If you live in the United Kingdom and you can make your way to London, the British Library Treasure Room is free. Go look at it. But if you're online, you can also see these, these vibrant colors. And when you look at them and recognize that each one was hand mixed, each paint was hand mixed by a whole bunch of different people who are gathering ingredients from all sorts of places who have to take the time to grind them down and wait for them to be the right shade. You know, you have to pick the plant at the right time. It is a massive effort. Why is this important? Why can't we just read the book? Well, because all of these things, when you put them together in a book, are meant to be telling the reader something. We have marginalia that looks kind of bizarre, but there are things in these books that are meant to tell the reader something. This is why there's an entire field of art history <laughs> and a subfield that looks at medieval manuscripts. And when you look at these things and really understand that human effort that goes into them, I think you understand that world better. So places where you can look at manuscripts are the eCodices website. The British Library has its treasure room, if you can get there. It's also got a manuscript search where you can see all the digital uploads of manuscripts. The Walters Art Museum has a great collection. I used a bunch of stuff from the Walters in my new book, Chivalry and Courtesy. The Getty, you can find a lot of stuff there. Bibliothèque Nationale de France, you can find a lot of stuff there. You can even look at Wikimedia Commons and find something and then do a reverse search and find it in the actual archive. And the reason you want to do that instead of just going to Wikimedia Commons and staying there is that usually a museum or a library or an archive will give you the ability to really zoom in. And they'll probably have a lot of information about the provenance of the manuscript, where it comes from what century. And that's all very important to historians and also really cool and interesting. I also think you can spend five minutes a day, try to spend just five minutes a day looking at material objects. I love material objects because they really make this history come alive. And again, this is something that you could see some of back in the day, but it's really, really opened up. And one of my favorite places to browse around is the Met Cloisters collection. And it is amazing. The photography is just brilliant. And you can just see everything from different angles. You can search very easily. They have a massive collection. The British Museum, for example, has a massive collection as well. I personally love the Met because it's so easy to use. <laughs> and then you can find, again, the provenance where this came from. How did it get there? What do we think this is about? And you can find everything from armor to actual objects like combs that people are touching every day. And I think that tells us so much. And if you spend five minutes a day just looking at an object from a different time and place, it's going to make you a better medievalist because you'll have a better concept of these people. And it's just something that wasn't available to us really back in the day. So the fifth point and the last point, the one I want to leave you with is to share. Share everything. Share your love. Share your knowledge share your enthusiasm. I mean, that's what I did just from my home back in the day. And I started to write and it has led to amazing places. And I have met the most amazing people. So I would say, start to share. If you're not sharing already, get on it, get on it, share five minutes a day, share your resources. If you are on social media, for example, there are a lot of people who are in groups. If you're not in a group, you can start one, share this information, this love, this knowledge. And share the things that your really good historians on social media are sharing with you. So, for example, share something written by John Wyatt Greenlee. It's going to make somebody's day to learn about medieval eels, for example. And it's going to increase people's knowledge. It's going to get a conversation going with you about this stuff. Sharing resources really is so helpful because... A lot of us don't know what is out there, and seeing this shared is so, so helpful. I think it's important to share your questions 
especially if you start following people on social media that are medievalists and you're listening to the conversation and you have a genuine question you want to ask it. Most of us are just delighted to help and you're not going to be the only person asking that question. So it's really helpful, I think, to get out there and share your questions. I do want to say that academics especially, well, all of us, but academics are very, very busy. So don't put a high expectation on a quick turnaround. But if you're asking a question on social media, for example, you might get other people jumping in and get your question answered. Sharing your questions is important because it gets the discussion going, like I was just talking about. And also, like I said, you're not the only person with this question. It will help everyone's knowledge to share your questions too. Share your knowledge with your friends and your family. We were talking about this last week. It can be dicey to do that, but eventually it will lift everybody. A rising tide lifts all boats. It's going to help everyone's knowledge to grow and increase. If you're sharing resources and sharing what you know with your friends and your family. I mean, we also want to make sure that the stuff that we're sharing is good. We might make mistakes. I've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. But we want to do our best to make sure the information we're sharing is good. And then we're going to share it with friends and family and let them know what's going on, what went on back in the past so that we all have a greater understanding. Something that I think is important, most of these things can be applied to people who are maybe students and want to become medievalists, go into the humanities. But I think a lot of you out there that are listening are not in the humanities, are not students, and are just interested in the Middle Ages. And for you, I think it's really important to share your information across disciplines. So for example, if you're in science, it's really cool and important to share information about history with other scientists because it makes us all better. I think that we often will see something written by somebody in the sciences, for example, who is just not aware of the history behind things. And so it's a lot of work to kind of pull back and correct things that might be wrong. So I really think that working across disciplines is so important. I mean, if you listen to the podcast that I did with Sarah Fidiment, talking about the analysis of a birth girdle, for example, that is so important. Or the work that Monica Green does, understanding the chains of transmission of the Black Death through working with scientists, so important. One of the places I had really good discussions and continue to have really good discussions is the zombie apocalypse medicine meeting, which I've been able to attend all three times so far. It's every two years through Arizona State University. But that's a place where all of these doctors are getting together from all sorts of aspects of medicine and talking about things in a fun way. And we have all sorts of questions for each other that open up our minds, our collective minds. And I think that's really important. So if you're somebody listening to this and you're in a totally different discipline, I mean, sharing that back and forth, that knowledge is so important and worthwhile. And it definitely will make a good case for why humanities continue to be worthwhile. And that's going to change things, hopefully, in the future where we have more funding for humanities. And finally, I think it's about sharing the love. I mean, this is something I've gotten at the whole time. It's something that is at the heart of my work, sharing the love of history, the love of the people who lived at this time, whether we are really big fans of what they're doing or not, sharing this love of understanding things and learning more, so important. If you are into the Middle Ages and you're not sharing the love, today's your day to spend five minutes sharing the love with other people. Create a book club where you're reading Marie de France, for example. Create an online group, join an online group. Share your favorite episode of the Medieval Podcast with somebody. Share the love. It's so important. And I think it's going to be extra important as we have people in the world that are using medieval studies for harmful purposes to share the love of it and the beauty of it with other people. That is how I got my start in this. It is why you're listening to this now because I was, I was going to say invested, but because this is a vocation, this is a calling that I can't seem to ignore. Just a real need to share the love of history with people is why this exists, why all my work exists. And I'm so happy to share it with you each and every week. And I really thank you for the opportunity. If you want to find the 5-Minute Medievalist and the 5-Minute Medievalist Guide to Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse, those are always available on my website, which is daniellesabelski.com. But now they're available on Medievalist.net's Patreon as well. If you want to share that love and have your donations spread out amongst a whole bunch of really cool medievalists and podcasters. 
I hope you have enjoyed today's episode. Five ways that you can spend five minutes a day becoming a better medievalist, learning languages, following medievalists on social media, reading primary sources, looking at manuscripts and material objects, and of course, sharing the love. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. Did you have a great Thanksgiving? Not too bad. Did some recordings, so I, I just did work. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, that's almost a vacation, right? If you enjoy your work, you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> that's exactly, what they tell us. exactly, yes. <laughs> fun times, fun times. So what's new? Well, we have a very special book of the month this month. On Patreon, we have a book club, and it is a Steve Tibble's book on the Templars, yes. which is which is brand new. You just talk to him, and I'm really delighted to have him doing that talk and also teaching a course, online course for us. Yes, perfect. I mean, yeah, well, I just spoke with Steve Tibble not too long ago. And if you get his book on Patreon through the book club, then you are supporting me, us, Steve yeah. as well. So that's an awesome way to get hold of the book. And if you join the book club, you might be coming up on some exciting books coming in the next few months as yeah. well, right? Yeah, I've heard there's a really good author on the way. <laughs> yeah, we'll just have to find out who it is. So yeah, if you want to be part of the Patreon book club, Steve Tibbles, all this month, all of October, if you join the book club, you can get hold of the Templars, the Knights Who Made Britain. We have this digital shop on Patreon, and you don't have to even be a, a member of, uh, of our Patreon to buy books. And we now have a couple of yours. Yeah, that's right. So for the people who've already been listening for the last couple of weeks, the 5-Minute Medievalist is up there. And now the 5-Minute Medievalist's Guide to Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse, because <laughs> it is the perfect time to be thinking about zombies in October. Yeah, and this is a book that I just put together as a way of talking about how medieval technology is going to be useful in a post-electric future. Yes. If you find yourself in The Walking Dead, this is actually going to be really useful for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really tiny book, but it's super fun. And it's one of the ones that people like best of all my work. So if you're interested in that, you can now get it on Patreon. Thanks. Thanks so much. So this week on Medievalist.net, well, we got some interesting news about Otto the Great, founder of the Holy Roman Empire. It looks like archaeologists have found where he died. Wow. That's big. So, yeah, you know, so is this spot in Central Europe where, like, there's text says he spent the night here and then he fell ill and he died. And afterwards, his son built a church. Now there's only ruins of this church, but underneath the ruins, it looks like there was a hall, a nice wow. big, big hall. And that's where he probably died. And he was buried elsewhere, but his heart and inner organs were left behind in this area. So it could be some. <laughs> they forgot them, or <laughs> I'm just kidding. Maybe he was a heavy guy. And they, you want to let him load. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Well, that's an exciting discovery. Yeah, you know, so it's good to see this kind of stuff. Archaeologists at work. So we have that. Plus, we have a bit on the earliest English joke book. Link in the word. So if you know your history of printing, he is one of the earliest printers in England, late 15th, early 16th century. And one of his many, many books that he produced was a kind of a joke book. Do you want to hear a couple of jokes? Yeah, lay it on us, man. What are some medieval jokes from so England? What is it that never freezes? Oh, I don't know. What never freezes? Boiling water. <laughs> Wait, he's never been to the Arctic, right? We've seen those videos where people <laughs> toss boiling water up in the air. True, true, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, give me another one. <laughs> all right. What is the distance from the surface of the sea to its deepest part? A long way. It's only a stone's throw. <laughs> okay, that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I thought like we've got, we've got about like 18 of them up and like some of them are funny. Some of them are uh, just cringeworthy. But it sounds like he, medieval humor. Yes. Fun stuff from uh, Week in the Word. Wow. OK, well, everyone is going to need to check that out because you always want to have a good medieval joke on hand for your next holiday party. <laughs> it's going to get into the holiday season. People are going to be going to parties. You want to have a medieval joke ready to go, right? Yeah, I, I think I think you got to get your medieval credentials out like, be able to. <laughs> Be able to tell a good story and a good joke and maybe even a prayer, medieval prayer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for helping us get all that in line. Thanks for stopping by, Peter. Thanks. A big thank you to everyone who supports my podcast as well as other indie podcasters and historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. 
Patrons can access all sorts of awesome stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, a book club, and ad-free versions of Medievalist.net and this podcast. You can even get my little digital books, The 5-Minute Medievalist and The 5-Minute Medievalist Guide to Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse, right on Patreon. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from five minutes to five centuries, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabolsky, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can pre-order my new book, Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, which comes out this month. If you've already pre-ordered, thank you so much, and watch your mailbox because some copies have already started winging their way across the world. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a fantastic day. (laughs) 